Welcome to the Constitution in American Life with the four Bs on this beautiful day in November. We come to you from Waukesha, Wisconsin, Bismarck, North Dakota, San Diego, California, and myself, Bakersfield, California, to discuss the American Constitution and those issues that confront us as a nation on a daily basis. We are joined today by the illustrious Professor David Adler, who comes to us from the, and I did not know this until today, the fastest growing state in the union, Idaho, soon to become California. <laughs> Dr. Adler was a professor of political science at Idaho State University for 25 years, a prize winning teacher and author. Professor Adler has written more than 100 scholarly articles on the Constitution and the presidency and has published four books. A former journalist, Dr. Adler has lectured internationally on the Constitution and is a former president of the Pacific Northwest Political Science Association. In 2010, he received the IHC's Outstanding Achievement in the Humanities Award given ad annually. Dr. An uh, Dr. Adler is currently the director of the Sun Valley Institute. Welcome back to our program, uh, uh, Professor Adler. It's good to see you. And uh, I hope that you are enjoying the fall uh, period. Have you guys got any snow lately? Thanks, Dave. It's great to be back with you and your colleagues. And we had about two days of snow, but it proved to be an aberration because we've had beautiful 55 degree weather ever since, and the leaves have been gorgeous. Uh, so we're hoping for an extended autumn campaign. Well, yes, we talked about before the show began, we're hoping for as much rain as possible uh, here in uh, California. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing the power of judicial review and attempt to provide students of the Constitution uh, some insights into how the Constitution should be interpreted and uh, the controversies associated with the job of interpretation. So I'd like to start out with uh, one of my favorite uh, historical uh, individuals, and that is uh, Chief Justice, the great Chief John Marshall. He said uh, in Marbury versus Madison, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial departments to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to a particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. So Professor Adler, I'd like to start with you, and it's kind of a two-part question uh, here. You hear quite frequently, and I make the mistake of reading the comments section in the Washington Post and the New York Times, probably shouldn't be doing that, but I do, that the court does not have this power of judicial review because it's not enumerated in the Constitution. So would it be accurate to say that judicial review is an implied power? Hmm. Thanks. That's a great question. I hear that a lot, too. I think the answer to that is that the framers of the Constitution roundly assumed that the courts, including the Supreme Court, would exercise the power of judicial review because by the time of the convention, it had become a working assumption that part and parcel of the business of judging is, as Marshall would later say in 1803, the authority to say what the law is, and in the case of conflicting laws, saying what the law is necessitates saying what the law is not. And there's plenty of historical evidence, Dave, to suggest that the framers were thoroughly familiar with the practice of judicial review. There is, of course, Hamilton's defense of it, his vigorous defense of it in Federalist 78. There's the attack on it by uh, Brutus, which implies its existence. Before that, of course, there's the fact that some 10 states had already practiced judicial review uh, before the convention. Uh, there were all kinds of scattered writings in journals and diaries by various members of the Constitutional Convention. And the roots of it go all the way back, I think, to Dr. Bonham's case in 1610, uh, where the, which the founders viewed as a very clear statement by Sir Edward Cook about the power of judging, uh, including the authority to declare the law null and void or in our time to declare it unconstitutional. Uh, so I think there's plenty of history to suggest it. And it was not a surprise then when Marshall asserted that authority of the court in 1803. Doesn't mean, of course, that it went without um, 
angering the Jeffersonians. That's a different story. I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, but the reality is, is that the court in the 1790s, in some concurring opinions, <clears throat> excuse me, even alluded to the availability of judicial review in those cases where the Constitution is, quote, clearly, clearly violated. That seemed to be the standard that the justices had in mind. A clear violation oh. would warrant striking down a statute as unconstitutional. Well, there were, uh, David, David mentioned ahead, David mentioned Brutus, um, and I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit. Um, Brutus clearly, in uh, eleven through fifteen, I think there are bits and pieces of those Brutus essays where he really uh, hammers on two things: the jurisdiction of the federal courts, but also he really uh, is concerned about the equity phrase. Um, some historians have made the argument that judicial review is actually textually in Article 3, and it's found in the notion of equity and how British equity courts, judges worked, um, where they would look at the common law and couldn't come up with any um, anything in the common law that helped them decide anything. And so uh, judge-made law would occur in the British system under an equity, I mean, literally, well, not literally, but judges would kind of put on their equity hat and come to a decision that they kind of were out there without any textual or common law support. And so Brutus is quite concerned about the word equity and um, what that would mean. In his conclusion, it would mean judicial sovereignty. Uh, but to David's point, he, he, Brutus uh, believes there, there is review. There is review. He's just afraid of sovereignty, judicial sovereignty in that embedded in that word equity. Well, so to you and Chris, and, and, and also Professor Adler and Mike, uh, what's Jefferson's bona contention here? And I'm curious, is Jefferson's, is it, is it just political? Uh, or is, it, is, is there a, a ideological foundation uh, to his criticism of Marshall and his problem with judicial review? I don't know who wants to jump on that. Well, there's the historical fight between their their uh, great granddaddies that uh, got the bad blood going in the family to start with. But uh, remember, I think I would say very quickly that his objection, especially in McCullough, uh, and uh, more so in McCullough than than uh, Marbury, is that Marshall is taking um, taking the Constitution and interpreting it loosely. Remember, he had objections to, uh, in the very early Washington administration, to Hamilton um, espousing the creation of a bank. And they had that, that essentially that great first argument about loose versus strict construction. So I think it goes back into the early Washington administration, the roots of Jefferson's uh, nervousness with loose construction, first with Hamilton, and then eventually in, in the Marshall Court's decisions especially on commerce and i think too with uh with whenever you're considering uh mr jefferson you always have to consider where he was and in what context he was writing or complaining uh was this you know was this when he was in the administration was this when he was the executive was this when he was out of office um i don't know that uh I, there tends to be a little bit of weather vane quality sometimes with jefferson and his complaints and uh, his concerns, but I mean, I think I think you know the idea of you know turning uh, the Constitution into ropes of sand or a thing of wax, uh, as he's famous for saying. I think those are valid concerns, though, when you're talking about the power of the court. Um, uh, so, I think it, 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 with Jefferson, context matters a great deal. Well, David, I'm curious. Is this is because I read a number of things this last week in preparation. And I saw a number of sources saying that judicial review is uniquely American in the 18th and 19th century. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. It was it was an American contribution to the world of political science, because after all, remember in England, where judges were inferior by definition, they they couldn't overturn earlier. They couldn't overturn an act of a parliament, for example. That's why when when um, James Otis in the Writs of Assistance case in 1761 tried to persuade the judges, all English judges, that the court had the authority to declare a law null and void, a law passed by parliament null and void. They were shocked. 
parliament was sovereign. So by definition, parliament could alter the constitution on a daily basis. So they were totally shocked. So this, this is a raw invention by the framers, but it represents a, a political tactic or a political strategy uh, by the colonists as they begin to look at ways of uh, undercutting parliamentary authority. And so when Otis makes that argument that a statute that violates common right or reason uh, is null and void, he is providing the playbook to the other colonists who want to tackle all kinds of legislation, the Stamp Act, the Hat Act, the Tea Act, you name it. There's the playbook. And so, uh, so Otis's contribution was huge. Others were thinking along the same lines, of course. So here was, if you, if you think about the battle with England and necessitating uh, the creation of a tool, a powerful weapon for the colonists, how to deal with a sovereign parliament, the only way to do it is to suggest that from uh, Dr. Bottom's case onward, from 1610 onward, there's a line of thinking that suggests that the courts have this authority. And, and so he was introducing a brand new conception of what constitutes a constitution, rather than parliament being the constitution, able to mold it, uh, change it on a daily basis. Here was Otis's idea of a constitution which is superior to government. Government derives its lawful authority from the constitution and cannot alter it except by extraordinary means, which would be the amendatory clause. Uh, and so that was shocking to the Brits and set off a great debate, uh, what, what we mean by a constitution. Uh, so, so the reality is, is that there's a long heritage born of political necessity uh, that, uh, tank, that dragged along some legal strategizing, uh, and then it provided this ultimate uh, playbook for the, for the colonists to do battle with the England with the English. Mike, you're a comparativist, and I'm curious, is this from your point of view as someone who deals in international relations, one of America's great exports? Or has it even been exported uh, around the world, this notion of an independent court with judicial review? Y yes, I mean, it definitely has. Um, most, if not all democracies today have some form of judicial review but it's usually spelled out in the constitution or there's some then statutes that kind of spell out how the process is supposed to work in different countries, parliament, the legislative branch can actually, we would call them advisory opinions, but they can trigger the review of legislation that might be unconstitutional even beforehand, right? So the judicial review happens before. Um, so yeah, this is definitely something that we see. And, and given that, given that I just, and maybe, maybe, um, David and Tim have already answered this question, but I'm just curious, given that it was a practice, everyone kind of knew it was there, people were afraid of it, why wasn't it just put into the text in very explicit language? Or is it to Tim's point that it was just with the equity clause? Because I still not quite sure I understand why they just didn't put it in Article 3 if it was that obvious. Well, and it was scared the bejeeg. <laughs> It'd scare everybody to half to death if they put that explicitly textually there. Think of what that means in terms of, uh, and you combine with that the supremacy clause, and, uh, and anti-federalists are upset enough at the supremacy clause in the jurisdiction of the courts to begin with. So there, to uh, explicitly say that would have politically been just uh, a bridge too far. I think that's that would be the cynical political answer. Uh, David, would um, would you push back on that or modify that? Well, you know, because we don't engage in any cynical politics or analysis, I, that sounds foreign to me. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, the I think the reality is is that it other part other powers in the Constitution go unmentioned. For example, as everybody knows, uh, the President and the Senate form the treaty making power but there's no mention of the authority to unmake or terminate treaties, even though the founders understood that would have to occur, right? So it might've been that the framers were too busy. I can't find anything in the debates or any other diaries that suggest that judicial review has to be hidden from the public. I think right. rather 
I think it's rather just assume that it's part and parcel of business of judging, given the fact that it had already been ongoing at the state level. And there's another point to make, um, and that is that no opponent of judicial review um, arose in the convention to suggest anything cynical. That is to say, there were plenty of opportunities. Consider, uh, and this is important for students to understand the real kernel of the idea uh, as expressed in the debate on the Council of Revision, Madison's idea to create a Council of Revision, uh, which lost not once, not twice, but three times. And his idea was to create a Council of Revision, as he explained it, that would include a, a convenient number of judges and the president who could essentially leaf through the pages of the US statutes and decide which statute should be removed, declared unconstitutional, too dangerous. That would be an awesome power for a council of revision. It could be done, of course, but the objection of some of the framers to Madison's idea was the inclusion of justices. And the debate makes it clear that the, the, uh, the objection of the framers was to be seen in the fact that that would invite on the part of the judges a policy-making role to weigh in on the relative wisdom of a statute which they believe to be beyond the judicial role uh, better left to the legislature. Uh, and so that, that sheds a lot of light on the framers own conception of the fact that the courts would exercise judicial review and how that power would be limited because whenever we talk about the origins of judicial review, uh, the next door cousin, of course, is how can it be limited? And as Tim pointed out, uh, Brutus is beside himself concerned that, in effect, judicial review will invite judicial arbitrariness. And it was only a decade before that people like Alexander Hamilton were expressing their great frustration about the uh, the about the imaginations of judges. And Hamilton in 1778 essentially said, who can track, who can follow the trackless imaginations of judges? Meaning they're not, they're not focusing on precedence. Their minds are going this way and that way, uh, essentially following their impulses, political preferences and so forth. More, more or less what Brutus was warning about. And that's always been the issue, aside from the origins argument, Dave, the real question is, uh, when should judicial review be exercised? How aggressively should it be exercised? And it goes back to that question you raised at the outset, how should the court interpret the Constitution? So we've got a bundle of very important questions uh, that could, uh, you, could be used to dominate one entire semester of a course. Yeah, well, and I wanted to ask uh, Professor Kavanaugh, uh, you know, as as our premier uh, high school teacher, as well as you know, college teacher, but a high school teacher, kids are asked to deal with this this basic equation of the common good versus individual liberty, and I think there's an overly romantic notion about the court, at least as far as how textbooks deal with them, that they are the bastions of def and defenders of of individual liberty. And yeah, we've got Brown, we've got Gideon, we've got Engel versus Vital. But my read of things, uh, Chris, is that throughout most of our constitutional history, the court has not been on the side of individual liberty uh, uh, in, in that uh, in that balancing act. That they they much more often are uh, going to protect the status quo um, uh, and not expand liberty. Uh, either push back or affirm me on this. And I hope you affirm me because I have low self-esteem. Well, <laughs> I think that, uh, I, I think I would tend to agree with you a little bit on that. that we, we, we like to think of these nine wise men and women, you know, that sit on the dais and, you know, render these decisions from like Mount Olympus. And they're going to always come down on the side of what's good for people. But we know that that's not the case. You know, they have there been incredible decisions. Yes. Have there been incredible decisions to expand the us and reduce the other? Yeah, absolutely. But the, for many times there haven't. I mean, and we were uh, just discussing um, uh, 
in uh, the previous episode um, about privileges and immunities in the slaughterhouse cases and how uh, had that been uh, interpreted differently and slaughterhouse had not been and privileges and immunities had not been killed in its crib, uh, that would have really opened up a, 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 an array of uh, individual rights claims under privileges and immunities. So I think that alone will tell you that, yeah, the court has not always been the champion of individual rights that we hope it to be. So I'm agreeing with you, David. Thank yeah, you for, very much. I mean, so for, every, the right, go for, ahead, every, for every Brown, uh, there's a Gobitis. Uh, there's a Korematsu. Uh, I mean, so it, uh, I mean, we kind of, we kind of do like the success stories. I mean, we're Americans for heaven's sakes, <laughs> but there's always, uh, there's always the, un, you know, the, the underbelly of, of bad decisions that are not pro-liberty, pro-individual rights. Yeah. Well, and I think, well, and I, I think to, to, to think about this too, why should we have to rely on courts to be the stopgap, right? Um, shouldn't that be a legislative position? Shouldn't that be a legislature's job? Um, I mean, I'm going back to Cicero, right? The greatest happiness to the greatest amount of people. Um, shouldn't that be a legislative thing to do? And so we rely on the, you know, the court as the, the backstop for protection. And it shouldn't have to be that way. It should be the, the first branch, and that's the legislative branch. You know, so it, it reminds me that Edward Corwin, who was a, a, a very significant constitutional scholar in the first half of the 20th century, thought that judicial review was the framers' way of hedging their bets. So you create a majoritarian democracy, but just in case Congress goes too far, goes wayward to, to hit on the points that Dave and uh, that Tim and Chris are making, uh, there's the court to check. So it's the last stop gap. But to I like Chris's point, why should we rely on the courts? Uh, if we rely on the courts and the courts don't deliver, then we can get a Korematsu, right? Or think about this just reading today's headlines. I'm sure students will be taking a look at the Supreme Court's oral argument in the Texas abortion case. And you hear, and you hear Sotomayor's uh, comments from the bench and she's exactly right. If this strategy uh, devised by the state of Texas to try to prohibit all abortions, which is to deputize every single Texan to identify any person who aids or abets uh, the performance of an abortion, driving somebody to a clinic, for example, then that strategy can be applied in other areas, as she pointed out, even ones that are near and dear to the hearts of conservatives. So, for example, that would mean it could this strategy could be used to undermine other fundamental rights. Because let's let's not forget Roe versus Wade is a fundamental established a fundamental right. So she says, what about contraceptives? You can see a strategy where somebody is deputized to call out and identify somebody who is aiding and abetting the purchase of a contraceptive device or uh, any other cases. What about same-sex marriage, this aiding and abetting? What the conservatives in Texas saw as an ingenious constitutional strategy could uh, come back and provide a real backlash, but the strategy would undermine the entire constitutional system. So the reason I raise that is because if the court decides to let this pass, the deputization uh, of every living person, uh, what happens to our constitutional order? It will turn every case, every issue will go to the Supreme Court. Then it becomes the ultimate stopgap state after state on every issue and the legislature is suddenly irrelevant and who serves on the court makes all the difference in the world well we're all I, I have a question i'd like to ask because I, I don't know much about 20th century jurisprudence but is it fair to say that like uh like a case like gobitis where it's a 
you know, the argument is it's for the common good that everybody uh, has the pledge, you know, national unity. I think that was actually Frankfurter's argument, if I'm not mistaken. But for every, for every decision that's uh, a champion decision for individual rights, do the dissenters say, uh, frame their arguments <laughs> as a common good argument and vice versa? Any decision that's a common good decision, do the dissenters say uh, natural you know, rights are at risk? I mean, how do dissents function in those champion cases on one side or the other? Well, I, I, go ahead, Dave. Oh, and it's okay. I'm sure. Uh, I'll I'll defer to you. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, we brought you on as the expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. well, you go, please. Well, well, I'm just going to say that, of course, the use of the common good is the common rhetorical device that we all employ. Who right. has never been engaged in a political argument uh, of any substance in which you or your opponent doesn't invoke that phrase "common good" because then it places you on the top of the mountaintop, you're arguing for the common good, which means by definition, your opponent is not, right? So that's a clever rhetorical device. Uh, and so Frankfurter, oddly enough, was willing to restrict civil rights, in this case, religious freedoms in the name of se national security, which was very odd, as if he imagined if little, if kids in first grade didn't recite the pledge or salute the flag that our national security would come crumbling down. What an overreach, right? So his rhetorical uh, excesses didn't serve him well, uh, but, but it's better for dissenters in that case, uh, for in any case like that, arguing against the common good is to say, we're not here to talk about the common good, we're here to interpret the constitution, right? I was going to say also, uh, Tim, to address your question, a lot of times there'll be a, a back to our, our favorite four letter F word, there's going to be a, def, you know, a de, uh, defer to the states, right? How's, how's common good best defined? Well, we're going oh, to let federalism is the word, right? Yeah, I, I, I got lost on the four letters. <laughs> so, you say four letter? Yeah, you did. Oh, my, yeah. my bad, because I use that in class. So it's my. <laughs> I talk about free being my favorite, my second favorite four letter F word. And the kids will watch it. Stop your it. Stop it. Well, oh, my first is food, clearly. <laughs> but deferring to states, the states are in the best position to determine what their common good is, right? And I mean, we think about, uh, we know the story behind Brown and how Jackson had to be conjoled to join the majority opinion in Brown because he was leaning that way. And uh, you know, you don't think of uh, Justice Jackson, um, his, his powerful descent in Korematsu, uh, you don't think of him in terms of uh, that regard, but it was deferring to the state. The state is in the best position to determine the common good. Well, I, you know, uh, Professor Williams, we, we know you're the easiest grader amongst us uh, being at your, <laughs> the university you're at. I, I can you give the can you kind of give a grade or some kind of parameters here for our students of what you would give the court on on their ability to balance the common good and individual rights over time? Uh, do, do you think they've done a good job of make of doing that balance or like me, do you think they've more often than not deferred to the status quo and protected certain vested interests? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I know that's why they pay me the big bucks. I pay you big bucks, don't they? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I see the court. I see the court throughout history being much more sort of like protecting the status quo. I think the exceptions are the ones that we often learn about, and that we, you know, rightfully we herald it because it's these moments of the court kind of, or a court right over a period of time pushing the envelope. But for the most part, I think the court has served as like a. I don't know, kind of like a, a break on, on too much change happening too fast. So I'm not sure your framing of it as the common good. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I, I agree with David's point about that's, that's a great rhetorical device. I think courts, whether they're pushing the envelope or not, are going to use the common good as a reason. Hey, uh, just I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the person who wrote uh, the, the We the People question here. So I want my hands clean on this. I got gotcha. you. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Tim, uh, I am 
one of the things in the, the number of years we've known each other that you you gave to me as an educator is this notion of the methods of interpretation are like a toolbox that the justices have certain tools in their uh, box to uh, uh, interpret the Constitution. But I've also seen so many varieties of how we label those tools. I'm just curious if, you know, how would you label those two? How many tools are there uh, in the toolbox and how would you label them? Um, well, I am I'm so glad you asked that question, David, because uh, I, I was uh, thinking about this session today and I went down to my tool shop in the basement and uh, I am prepared to answer with visual aids. <laughs> uh, the way, actually, the way the people book is great on this. It, it lays out, uh, and I think for students first uh, considering methods of interpretation, the way the people text is fantastic. Uh, the first one they lay out is textualism. Uh, textualism is, hey, just look at the text, Dopey, and uh, interpret the text. So a tape measure is kind of like textualism. Read one and eighth inch. It's not one and, and sixteenth. It's not one and thirty, you know, nine, uh, thirty seconds. It's one and an eighth. It's very simple. It's a tape measure. Uh, the second method they lay out is original intent. Okay, <laughs> you drill down, you drill down to find the original intent of the framers, and then you take out a second tool. This is called a contour gauge. Um, you, it's uh, it's really squishy. Uh, there's a bevel on the edge of my table, so it replicates um the original intent you drill down for the original intent and the contour gauge shows you exactly what they uh it's supposed to look like uh the third method of interpretation they have in the text is uh you know stay true to founding principles so i'm suggesting that a uh, a sheet metal bender <laughs> here's a piece of sheet metal here's the constitution uh, you put a, a sheet metal bender on it and it bends perfectly the sheet metal. So you still have a constitution, it's still recognizable, but you're, you're using kind of some principles found in the constitution and you're, and you're, you're slightly modifying it with, you know, founding principles. Now, the last one in the text is, um, uh, they call something like, uh, just interpret the constitution with felt needs of the time um that's the blowtorch you don't really need you really don't need a text uh if you're going to interpret a text to, to to basically the the felt needs of the time so uh those would be the tools in my toolbox today and i realize there are tremendous weaknesses in each one of these interpretations of mine as to how to interpret which tools to use mm -hmm. but that's uh but the text is great the we the people text is great well i'm going to go with that and dr williams my biggest problem with, is with originalism or original intent because i've never figured out how you assess that because when you look at originalism, it's from the intent of those who wrote, whether the original constitution, uh, you know, or is it the ratifiers of the original, you know, again, the whole myriad there. Uh, uh, so in your opinion, is it even possible to measure original intent? And do other countries do that as well? Do they look to original intent? Well, you want me to follow the guy who just had a blowtorch? You're allowed to use visual. You're allowed to use visual aids there. He's like, that was amazing, Tim. That was great. Um, it really was. So, look, I'll, I'll I'll take a first crack at this, but we know I think we know that um, David Adler and others can uh, have something much better to say on this. Like, like, okay, original intent, original text. I think it's like, well, the first thing I want to say to the students is. This is the the tools that that Tim just showed are super important, right? We've already established this idea of judicial review is at best counter-majoritarian, right? And so 
The notion of allowing unelected officials to overturn the will of the people through the legislature, that's, that's an important power. And I think we would all agree there should be parameters to that power. So this, these tools are the parameters. Like, how do, we, how do we know when we're getting that right? What should we allow judges and, to do? So the idea of original intent, my understanding of it is, is to, well, first you can look at the text, read the text, drill down, as Tim said, and I think you're going to be the strictest interpretation of this method, this tool, would be to look at the text and ask yourself, find out what did the framers intend by that? And I think you could keep it that narrow. Then there's debate about whether, well, is it just what the framers were doing? Or do we then want to open it up to um, the debates, the debates with others? Do we look at what the anti-federalists were saying about it? Because does that give us an insight of what was going on? And you can continue, I guess, to drill down to look for that meaning. I think, I think the intent of original intent as a tool is, 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 I see the intent. I have issues with your point, David, about how do we actually know when we found it. And I'm sure that Chris, Tim, and David can all talk about how the founders all had maybe different meanings they were attaching to different phrases and they had different ideas. Um, and then there's the more normative question about, is that something we should actually be doing, right? Should we care what a group of individuals, um, all men, all white, were thinking about the Constitution 230 plus years ago? And that's maybe a different question we can talk about. But I, David, I would love to hear, David Adler, what, what you think about David's question on this, if I was on the right track or not. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I like what you said. First of all, I, I really like Tim's approach. I want to call this the Carpenter's Constitution. I think we got a new approach here. Um, so uh, in my thinking about original intent, I like to frame it on the, I like to phrase it on the basis of the purposes, the aims of the framers. And in this, I'm guided by what Blackstone, the the great English law commentator and others uh, of his age and even before him uh, did as they tried to capture the intent of the legislature, that is the parliament. So all of these legal commentators uh, from uh, many hundreds of years ago believed there was an intent to identify. Uh, and what they did, according to um, Blackstone, was to identify the evil uh, that a statute is addressing. The evil that a statute, the harm, the problem, the, the worry, the evil as, as the word they use. And this is um, often uh, easily done because the participants in a debate on a legislative measure, let's say in parliament, are all in one way or another addressing the real problem, the real worry or the evil. Whatever that evil is then, I, I've said in my own writing, constitutes the North Star uh, for understanding uh, what the framers had in mind. So in our constitutional convention, when you see the framers writing any particular clause, um, most of the participants are addressing the same problem. So uh, in, the, in the case of the war power, for example, the single evil that they're all concerned about is the idea that a single man could take us into war, right? Drawing on the practice of English kings and others across the centuries. That's what they wanna remedy. The evil then is the idea that a single person could take us into war. The evil is unilateral executive war making. So they provide a remedy by giving the power to Congress. So my approach to understanding, uh, to the extent possible, what the framers are attempting to do is to identify that evil that becomes the North Star uh, for our understanding of, of the um, deliberations. And I would limit it, my, in my own perspective, I limit the claim of intent or purpose to what occurs in the Constitutional Convention, because they're the drafters, they're the writers. What occurs at the ratifying stage is important because those are the people who are going to say yes or no to the proposed Constitution. Uh, 
But the ratifier's understanding, I believe, should not be confused with authorial intent, should not be confused with the intentions or purposes of the drafters. It's a different, uh, a different kind of uh, subject. But the value, and this is what connects it to us and can help lend, um, lend help to understanding the framers' purposes, is this. In every constitutional, excuse me, in every state ratifying convention, there was at least one framer who in theory was there to explain what the convention was up to. How, why did they do this in this provision? Or what about that clause? To the extent that that, that person or persons could explain to the ratifying conventions what the constitutional convention had in mind, that can assist the understanding of the ratifiers. So if, once we conduct that, we ask ourselves, is there a great gulf between what the ratifiers understood a provision to mean and what we can glean uh, as the intent or purpose of the drafters of the constitution? If you find a great gulf, then that suggests perhaps that the intent of the framers in Philadelphia is murky and hard to ascertain. But if the ratifiers seem to agree uh, that this was the particular aim or purpose, then we've got a lot of people in agreement as to what the convention was attempting to accomplish. So I, I think that's, that's how I look at that, those disparate issues. David, I, I guess, how do you address, um, well, some, some, I, I'm, I'm kind of perplexed how you would wrestle with the issue of when you're plopping into the convention to, to figure out what their uh, intent was. Like, as we all know, what early in the convention, De Delegate A would say something, end of the convention, he would say something different. So mm -hmm. how do you address uh, someone who, I guess me at this point, who would say um, it might be a little hard to do that depending on when you go into that summer's debates. Sure. Yep, that's a good point. Good point, Kim. I think you have to take a look at where the convention stood at the end of the meeting, uh, the matured conclusions of the Constitutional Convention. So taking note of what you say is true, that people change their minds, and we take that to be a high point of intellectual thinking. Where did they come down at the end? Uh, was there a, a general consensus and understanding that would aid or sh that would shed light? May not always yield a perfectly clear purpose, uh, but uh, it often does. And all of this, uh, to be clear, is different than the question of asking, even if we can ascertain the purposes of the framers, does it matter? That goes to the interpretive debate. How much, even if we can uh, ascertain those, does should those necessarily bind us? Should they be given a lot of weight, little weight? Right. That that would be a contemporary debate. So, uh, uh, Chris, I just want to weigh in here with a couple of things, um, and I think uh, Madison himself had talked about how to interpret. And he said, first you go to the document, right? And then you go to the debates that were out of doors at the time, you know, the, whether it be federalist, anti-federalist writings, and then you look at the ratifying conventions and, and you, not to look at his notes, right? He, 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 that was not, he, I think he said, you know, you look at the document, you look at the debate that's out of doors and you look at the ratifying conventions in that order to, for interpretation. Um, I think the concept of original intent is a very modern, concept uh, i think it's i think it's for and what as we understand i think it's a more modern concept and i would recommend one book to the students and, and i'm sorry i don't have it here to hold up uh it's by uh, jack balkan called living originalism and uh i think that it, it will really help the students if you're talking about judicial interpretation and methods of interpretation uh balkan's book is uh, very good on that well, if I could follow up, Chris, uh, you know, Tim did an actual excellent visual representation well, of all these tools. Was, I think it was originally called Carpenter's Hall. So I'm just yeah, gonna... uh, good point. That's a good point uh, there. <laughs> um, and and we we focused on originalism, but and this is I'm going to start with Chris, but anybody else who wants to jump in, what problems do you see with Tim's other tools, whether it's literalism, 
uh, or and again, I, I call it modernism, uh, which is probably a misnomer, but this idea of, you know, of, of what was it, the blowtorch uh, yeah. uh, method there. So, so Chris, to you, take take one of those and do, what, what weakness or problem do you see with one of the other tools? And on my inner Justice Scalia here and talk about a substantive due process and where he calls it flotsam and jetsam. And for the students watching, that may, means it's just not very, the whole idea that judges are making things up out of whole cloth, right? So can you, you, can you give an example of a case where you think that method predominated in the decision? Um, I, I don't, I, because I end up agreeing with the concept of substantive due process. I like the idea of judges being able to determine the fairness of a law and how it actually treats people. And not being beholden to what Justice Scalia calls, you know, his version of originalism or textualism. Well, let me ask it this way, because David brought up today's oral argument. And, and I'm going to be quite honest. I've always had a problem with, with the decision making, the method of interpretation of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade, to me, to me seems to be the, the, the penultimate example of the blowtorch of creating something in in many ways out of nothing with penumbras and i know they're you know they're referring to griswold there um but uh, you know as far and not the end result i i may agree with the end result but the way they got there seems problematical uh on how they came up with this notion of the right to reproductive freedom uh, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that chris well I, I, this is where we've been talking about uh the privileges and immunities clause. It'd be nice if the court actually would revisit that, and uh, you know, give, to to countermand that that ruling in the slaughterhouse cases in the 1870s, uh, because I mean, the privileges and immunities clause is there for a reason. We have privileges and immunities as citizens as citizens of this country. We should be able to hang our hats on that hook to make an argument for reproductive rights. Right for re for control over our our, our bodies, right? Uh, going back to boy, going back to Sir Edward Cook, there are places that the king doesn't belong, right? Uh, there are places that the you know that the no matter uh, gosh I forget the wording talking about a shack no matter how poor a man shack may be and no matter how much the wind may whistle through it there are certain places that the crown does not have a right to be in, and I think privileges immunities if we would go back to that that would that would help us also in a great deal. Mike, I, I, what do you think about this? And I know I've kind of really messed up this whole topic uh, in some ways, uh, but weaknesses with any of the other tools or any comments about how the court came to decide Roe versus Wade? Did you choose anything you, you want to talk about here? <laughs> I apologize. Reach in and grab a tool. <laughs> yeah, no, don't apologize. Um, I. I to me, the weakness is I, li I liked the founding principles example that Tim was showing, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, this goes back to a discussion that we had on, on another, another uh, segment about the, how the amendment process is so hard, right? And the truth is, is that societies change and values change. And when, it, when it's so hard to change the text of a constitution, we have to start relying upon interpretations of the text to simply move us to where maybe we already are or wh where we think we should be um to me like we've the constitution itself has set up some institutional rules and constraints that make it very hard for us to have these sorts of discussions outside of the parameters of of what we're talking about judicial review and courts and interpreting so i i don't know if that's answering your question um uh, but i don't i don't I don't see another way we go about it, given the constraints we have in our current constitution. David? No, I have, a, I have some thoughts about the Roe uh, point. The, um, the reality is, is that Roe versus Wade can also be grounded in originalism. Here's why. That during the colonial period and early statehood period, uh, most states permitted abortion, permitted abortion up until the point of quickening. So that was the outer parameter, right? And so that meant that the founders were aware 
uh, that there would be interest in obtaining abortions, provided for abortions, didn't criminalize abortions. And so in Roe versus Wade, in upholding this right, and early on, at least in the first trimester, the court isn't far removed from that early understanding, the early statehood period in America, when abortions uh, were permitted or at worst uh, punished as a misdemeanor. So the real question here is why doesn't the court or why don't defenders of Roe versus Wade access history more frequently as a way to defend their position, particularly when they are in, involved in argument with, let's say, conservatives who want to invoke originalism against them. That's a David, curious... David, can I can I okay. ask you? Did sure. the court in in the decision in the written decision did they did they mention that did the majority mention that history? Just in passing, and so in my view, that was a that's my criticism of Roe that it was a chance for the court to ground it. Um, but there's a reason why. Uh, people on the left have historically shunned the use of history and it goes back to Brown. And that's because when the Brown versus the Board of Education came down, uh, it was believed that the court was acting in contrast to history and to have tried to take a, to take a perspective that originalism matters would have set up the Brown decision as being illegitimate. When in reality, uh, we can demonstrate that the Brown decision was actually grounded in the aims of those who framed the 14th Amendment. That is equal protection, for example. And you can see it in the 1875 Civil Rights Act, 1875 Civil Rights Act that you may have discussed at an earlier session. And so it's, it's Brown that is more consistent with the aims or the purposes of the, the framers of the 14th Amendment not Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy is the outlier. Um, the civil rights cases of 1883, that's an outlier. Uh, so there's a long history, at which is a fascinating subject to explain why the court in Brown didn't pursue uh, the history. It had a lot to do with a historical memo written by Alexander Bickel, who was the law clerk for Felix Frankfurter uh, at the time. And he concluded the history was uh, inconclusive, uh, but that did great damage because that meant that the majority in the court said, well, we can't use history, a big error. And it, it's been uh, something they've tried to resolve ever since. Yes, Zim, Chris. Push back a little bit here, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm going to, um, is if you're talking about a, a perspective in terms of uh, abortion rights, going back to an original position. Now, because was this that was allowed at the state level? Yes. So yeah. then, then before the, there was a before there was a federal government. That's right. right. Yeah. So if we go back to the original position, do we go back to say, well, this should be a state decision and not a federal decision? Well, there, that's an interesting question, but it also involves the Ninth Amendment, because if we ask, what does the Ninth Amendment protect? And we know it protects rights not enumerated in the Constitution. Leonard Levy's uh, perspective on the Ninth Amendment, which I like a lot, says, let's ask ourselves what practices were familiar to government at the time of the framing, not criminalized, not prohibited. It would be assumed that those practices, widespread and familiar, must have been permitted. And uh, it would be hunting to a degree, fishing to a degree, and I think it would be abortions to a degree. Uh, because they were practices that were widespread and familiar, and states chose not to criminalize, not to punish them. You, you realize there are going to be some students and perhaps teachers watching this to say, you just equated hunting and fishing to uh, uh, abortion services. Yeah, no equation, no moral equivalent. But but if I was giving examples of what might fall within, right. Yeah, but you're uh, right. And, Some might conclude that. Yeah. And, and I got to say, uh, Professor Adler, thank you. Thank you, thank you. You're the first scholar in 20 something years who has referenced the Ninth Amendment. Be because to me, that was the mistake of the court. 
is 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 they there's a Ninth Amendment out there, and I know, it, and again, I'm befuddled of why it hasn't been referenced more often uh, uh, in that sense. And, and Professor Moore knows this. Yeah, that's why he's got a smile on his face. And I've been arguing for years uh, about the the Ninth Amendment's role, especially in Griswold and abortion and some other things that have come since then. And so I'm so glad to hear you reference uh, that. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, uh, I'm curious about uh, any weaknesses in your other tools. Uh, oh, each, each one of them, each one of the interpretive tools has weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses. I, I don't think any of them are, are watertight, frankly. Um, but I do, um, I do, I'm perplexed by the Ninth Amendment, um, largely because I, um, I'm not convinced that Madison was fully behind much of anything substantive when he suggests the Ninth <laughs> and Tenth Amendment. Uh, there's an argument to be made that the Ninth Amendment is to um, shut up the remaining Federalists are in the first Congress who are still upset that, you know, you shouldn't list rights because it's dangerous. So that's a sop to them. And um, I'm willing to consider the, pa the possibility that the Tenth Amendment is a sop as well to shut the anti-Federalists up who had been screaming uh, for three years about the dangerousness of this this uh, consolidated national government. So it, I, I take kind of a cynical view of the Ninth and Tenth Amendment being used for anything uh, there, interpretively. There. It's there. I know, I know, I know it's in the text, <laughs> but the story of how it got there is, is a little suspicious to me. So I, I uh, you're an originalist. I'm yes. not saying it's watertight. I'm not saying it's watertight. I'm just saying I know that Madison wasn't gung ho on either one of them. He's dead. This is one of the rare moments where Chris <laughs> and I are on the same page, man. Calling you out there, Professor Moore. Uh, so we've got to we've got to begin to wrap this up. So I'd like to end our session with uh, the kids have to deal with this notion of landmark cases, and uh, I got to go to the scholar on this uh, to our our guest because. I don't know. Do editors and publishers decide what are landmark cases? I mean, how, you know, in my view, a landmark case is one that changes the course of our constitutional history. But is there something broader or narrower that I should be thinking about, David, on what a landmark case is? How does, how does a case become landmark? Oh, that's a good question, Dave. I, uh, it's easy to use that word too loosely. It's like saying everybody in the NBA is a superstar. I get tired of that. Everybody that laces up sneakers is a superstar. <laughs> the word star used to be fine with me. Sneakers? You use the word sneakers, David? No. Well, I'm trying. And, and Jim, I want to bring back the word swell. I want to, use, oh. I want to resuscitate the word swell. At any rate, um, so... The, the reality here is that a landmark case does transform American law, does change it, uh, or it entrenches it for, uh, for all time. So you would think about those landmark cases like McCullough, or you would think about Brown, for example, um, any number of cases that seem to entrench an important, can't be on a menial issue, a small issue, but on a vital issue, uh, of a particular time that lives on. I, you, a landmark case wouldn't be one that gets overturned uh, anytime soon. So Roe versus Wade is a landmark case. It countenanced um, American women's right to access abortion. If that gets overturned, is it any longer a landmark case or did it have a, a lifetime of you know, 50, 60 years? That would be an interesting, example a rarity because we don't and it's a, another issue for another time you guys might have talked about this since when the since when has the court eliminated a fundamental right that's what's at issue here in roe if the court overturns roe versus wade and essentially says there is no fundamental right to an abortion in what other area, in what other time has a fundamental right just been eviscerated by a court? As Mike said, unelected officials, counter-majoritarian people eviscerating a constitutional right. If I can be a contrarian for a moment, David, uh, is property a fundamental right? 
I think so. I think it is, yes. So hasn't the court numerous times, especially from the New Deal on, at least chiseled away the notion of the fundamental right to property? I think the courts tried to clarify what constitutes a fundamental right within property. I think that's the way to understand it, yeah. Gentlemen, uh, uh, any of you, as, as far as a landmark case, uh, have a, a, a take on that? On what no, constitutes? No, but that doesn't prevent me from weighing in. Uh, I do, I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> I'm intrigued by David's thought that rights may automatically fast track our um, willingness to define a case as landmark. I, I just, I mean, does, do people get as excited about separation of power cases? Uh, do people get excited about these structural, you know, federalism? Uh, so I, I'm intrigued by the idea that maybe rights, because we, as Americans, we're very concerned about rights, that they automatically have an advantage um, to be considered landmark because they involve rights. Yes. I, I guess they do because that's what ends up in our history books. That's yeah. what ends up, you know, that and what ends up in our high school government classes are yeah. those cases that expand the us and reduce the other, right? Um, that moves us to that idea of a more perfect union. So the, that's where it makes it easier for us to study those cases, like yeah. you know, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, Brown cases that move us, I, I, in my opinion, move us forward as a society and not backward. But, you know, you have cases that involve the Chevron doctrine. Is that a landmark decision? Absolutely it is. Well, but, let me ask you, Chris, is Citizens United a landmark case? Oh, yes, it is. Absolutely a landmark decision. Because it did, it move, did it move us forward? My opinion? <laughs> well, no. your scholarly understanding. Well, no, my point is with Tim's about the, on rights cases, right? on individual rights cases are made. And Citizens United is a rights case. Uh, sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> corporations equal people. Uh, I mean, didn't we try to settle it back in the 1800s with the, yeah. was it Santa, Santa Clara County? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Williams, you get the task, because you did it so well a few sessions ago, of of kind of wrapping up and what what recommendations would you give to students and then I, I david i'd like you to do this as well what recommendations would you give the students to think about as far as this question goes oh man david i'm sorry i know you but you don't like being the first guy to ask questions now you don't like being the last guy well i just uh, i mean i think all these comments we've been making the students should be like, listen to those i mean this is this gets to the um to me this question gets to the heart of what it really means that we are a democratic republic right and it gets to the heart of um what the founding principles are and how do we maintain those in a majoritarian system with limited opportunities to amend the constitution i just i i can't i mean having this discussion is just re-emphasized to me um how important it is for all of us to be aware of this process and be aware of the ways in which justices decide to interpret the constitution it's if they're they're trying to strike this balance about what those founding principles are and how we know what they are so i don't think i did a very good job right there but i'm going to hand it over to professor adler to bring us home i, I think mike i think you did a swell job swell job <laughs> it was really good the, uh, Wow. You know, on this, it's it's a, such a fascinating question. Here's what I would say to students as you think about what constitutes a landmark case. They are the cases that amplify or illuminate fundamental principles uh, that endure for years to come. So if you think about Marbury, it's a, it's a landmark case because the, it was the first time the court applied judicial review, the principle of judicial review. If you think about McCullough versus Maryland, why it's a landmark case, because the court addressed in a fundamentally important way grand issues such as are the people sovereign or are the states sovereign, an enduring issue. And even though the court said, of course, people are sovereign, it didn't resolve the issue because we had civil war. Uh, 
right? Uh, it, why is Brown a landmark case? Because it penetrated that issue of segregation, which went to the concern of what citizenship involves and what equal protection means. Roe versus Wade is a landmark case because it, it exalted a fundamental right that women have the right to determine what to do with their uh, biological organs. Why is, why is Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company, the steel seizure case, a landmark case? Because it represented the most, the most invigorating examination of presidential power extant. And so I think you, we view landmark cases that way. Uh, it, what is the court doing in these cases? What's it saying? What principles uh, might it be unearthing? And do they stand the test of time? They, they can always be altered, of course, and we may see that Roe is overturned. But uh, I think that's how to think about these landmark cases. Yeah. Well, students, unfortunately, we've uh, run into uh, the end of time here as far as uh, this session goes. As I've said uh, throughout my experience with this program, time is always uh, our enemy. But uh, we also promised a number of sessions ago that we'd always introduce new vocabulary terms to you. So tonight we've given you SOP and, uh, and, and a, a word from a generation or so ago, SWELL, uh, there. So we hope that we'll, we'll see you <laughs> using SOP and SWELL uh, in, uh, in your discussions uh, there. Uh, next session, we're going to be uh, moving into Unit 5 and uh, individual rights, and we'll uh, hope you will uh, join us uh, then. Until that time, uh, peace, love, yogurt tacos, bye-bye, use your toolbox, bye-bye. <laughs>